Hello and welcome to Thrift Fest Upcycle, the digital edition of Festival of Thrift. My name is Andrea and um, I would love for you all to say hello in chat. So please tell me where you're from, what your names are, just to say a quick hello. I don't know if I can see you. Great, so um, we are, um, this panel chat is a Young Voices and the Climate Emergency, asking how can we build back better? And we've got a panel um, of, uh, we've got four young people here today. We've got Days Agaji from Extinction Rebellion. We've got Charlie Jobling from Teesside University, Laura Waistel also from Teesside University, and Phil, Finn Schumacher from Sustainable Business, who has a sustainable business even. So um, this first part, is a 13 minute panel discussion with our speakers uh, where you can also put your questions into the chat for the panel to discuss. Uh, and then we're gonna have a World Cafe managed by our friends um, at the Tees Valley Nature Partnership where you can get to discuss, share ideas and open up solutions. Um, I'll be guiding the discussion and asking some questions along the way. So a little bit about myself, um, uh, I'm Andrea Ling. I um, am a freelance director and writer and visual artist. I make work that's either political, um, about cultures and um, climate change, specifically from the viewpoint of indigenous knowledge and leadership. I'm also the artistic associate with Metis Arts, which makes kind of theater and performance installation work. Um, and a lot of the work that we do is about remodeling our world city or location in regards to climate change and how can we reimagine a better future. Um, I do think with climate crisis we can feel really powerless, um, we can leave it to scientists sometimes or um, and we all have a part to play um, and I all think we can have fantastic ideas either on a micro or macro level and um, this is why I'm here and I'd love to discuss with you and um, obviously with the panel. So um, I would like to introduce um, First of all, um, Days, would you like to introduce um, what you do and who you are? Hi, um, I'm Days Gargi. I'm a youth climate activist. Um, my like work is primarily in Extinction Rebellion as the Youth Regenerative Culture Coordinator, which is actually quite similar to what Andre does. Um, it's about visioning a better future and putting that in act now. Um, we do learn lots from Indigenous culture and it focuses on five main stages, uh, which is self-care, interpersonal care, community care, um, action care and action well-being, and then planetary and earth care. Um, and also I'm a political candidate that ran for the EU parliament as the youngest person to do so. That's fantastic. And we also have Charlie Jobling. Charlie, introduce Hiya. yourself. Hiya, I'm Charlie. Um, I've just graduated from Teesside University in biological sciences. Um, I did my dissertation on the toxicological and physical effects of plastic pollution in seabirds. And then I took part in the summer placement where I continued my work on plastic pollution, but mainly focusing on the toxolo toxicological and physiological effects of plastic additives in a whole range of different species. Thank you. And Laura Waitzel. Hi, um, I'm also from Teesside University. I'm uh, currently in my third year of environmental science and I'm also working on a, a similar project, um, students as researchers and a summer placement looking at the, um, the effects of global change factors on plants. Fantastic. So, um, and then we have finally Finn. Hi, uh, I'm Finn, I'm 16. And at the beginning of uh, lockdown in London, me and three friends started a company, FFSB, which aimed to create uh, sustainable and reusable face masks for everyone. And yeah, that's about it. Perfect. So I want to, the first question is an open question. Um, when or what moment did you decide to pursue a career or path um, to combat climate, climate change? Was there a particular moment in your life um, or was it something that you've always kind of thought of? I'd love to hear kind of how you, that, that first moment of kind of maybe deciding. 
Um, I've just always had a quite a, a big interest in sustainability and especially like marine biology and the marine side of things with pollution and also how like plastic pollution contributes to climate change like more indirectly than sort of the, the direct effects of say fossil fuels on climate change. The ones of, with plastic pollution are a bit more, more subtle um, and I've always found that really interesting. And what about anybody else about how they've, like days? how did you get into your activism work? Yeah, weirdly enough, I actually stumbled into it. Um, I always wanted to be a sex historian, nothing to do with the environment. Um, <laughs> um, I ended up like going to boarding school and I lived in Lincolnshire and I learned how to love the land and tend for it and care for it. And I, when I came back to London to live back with my mum, I got really ill. Uh, I had really bad asthma and a lot of issues with my skin. Um, and then when I started looking into it, I found out about air pollution and the effect that it has on marginalised communities all across London, all across the UK cities, especially, and all across the world. And through that, I kind of started finding my way around, you know, the emergency and figuring it out and coming to terms with where we're at. Um, and then when I was in uni, I went through like a couple of years of like just being like really angsty as a teenager, being like, oh, everything's awful. I'm just not going to do anything about it, though. Just bitch and complain about it. <laughs> and then uh, my friend actually went to an Extinction Rebellion protest and she was telling me how amazing it was. Um, and I decided to go to an opening meeting with her. And that was on a Wednesday. And by Monday, I was working full time with Extinction Rebellion and have been so for the last over a year now. Wow. And what about you, Finn? How did you get into your sustainable business? Well, I've always been interested and, you know, conscious of sustainability. I was never, you know, that focused on it. But in the beginning of lockdown, me and three friends obviously got together. And uh, one of my friends, Sebastian, he's, uh, he's also part of FSB. And his dad's a, he owns a biz, uh, clothing company and they're a B Corp. So they're, you know, registered as very uh, eco-friendly. And then we sat down together and we, you know, decided we wanted to create face masks that were sustainable and ethically good. And then from there, it just really got started. And then we started to pay more attention. We were, you know, started to grow a passion for it as well. And now I'm here. And Laura, I'd love to hear about your interests. Because um, you, we've spoken before and you've talked about um, looking at ecology, um, uh, ecosystem services I'd love to hear more about what you do yeah um, I think Teesside really help with that because they offer um, a student as researcher scheme so it gets you know undergrads to actually get involved in in real research you know you're not just completing a project for uni you're actually you know contributing to real science and um, that's what really sort of sparked my interest in ecosystem services and the project that I'm working on now looking at global change factors is sort of really carrying on from that in terms of all of the things that are building up in the atmosphere that might have a real impact on human health we've been looking at um how it might affect allergenicity of plants for example and how climate change might be increasing that for people yeah and I guess a question I was interested to ask um, you, Days, was um, what opportunities are there for young people to take action to instigate change? I think that there are so many opportunities, especially in a time like now, where young people's agency is really being like acknowledged and recognized like never before. Um, I always think of activism as in like three stages. Um, so the first would be how as individuals we can come to terms with what's happening, um, what has happened, how we can grieve for the loss of, you know, um, biodiversity and a livable and stable climate. Um, and then how we can create like individual change for us. Um, and then how we can take that into our community spaces and do that within our schools, our workplaces, our hospitals hospitals and start talking about the climate and allowing there to be like space and openness around that and then we take it to the big boys which is the government <laughs> and international governments and international corporations and we tell them what we deserve we tell them how to act um, because that's how democracy works they're meant to be for us and I think that as young people especially um, with 
it being so important right now that we are fighting for our futures. We're fighting so we can, you know, be scientists or be whatever we want. Um, and that world will not be feasible if we don't do something now. Fantastic. And, and obviously, we've seen um, young people really take a big um, step forward in, in terms of activism. We've had a lot of, um, you know, we think of Greta and we think of other kind of large leaders, young people who've actually put the way forward um, and wanting change. Um, so do you think, and then this is an open question to everybody, do you think that is then therefore a general direction that um, young people are really engaging in the climate crisis? Or do you also think within young people there are still... Um, uh, barriers or they're still um, convincing maybe um, to do with how we might action for the climate crisis? I think there are definitely barriers especially maybe in education for some. Some people that I've spoken to my age and younger are sort of having doubts about climate change or maybe just because they haven't really had that chance of education and I think there's also barriers in terms of maybe poverty and other things going on. They've, they've got bigger problems in their own lives and I think worrying about such a big issue of climate change is just far too much to really ask. Yeah and I, I think that also kind of goes on to an, a kind of another subject here that I know is quite difficult that um, you, you know sometimes the climate crisis is kind of the, the, the forefront the interface of it does look like it's you know certain types of people that are able to talk about it more than others. It, the, the, I do see that there's a lack of diversity um, within that. I don't know if anybody else has kind of shared that as well, that sometimes it's socioeconomic, sometimes that's to do with um, race or that's to do with a certain status as well. Has anyone mm, else found I think, that? I think we have to acknowledge that um, the climate crisis, like, so the way that we see in regenerative cultures and XR is that um, it's through learned behaviours that we've got to the climate crisis. It's through us learning how to abuse and use one another. And we've done the same to the earth. Um, and then if we correct our behaviours and start to learn how to act with compassion and care and duty to one another, we'll do the same to the earth. And in that way, we can actually connect it to so many other issues. And I think that we need to stop thinking of the climate as something that's happening in the next 100 years, because it's happening right now. It's happening now in the global south more than ever. Um, and this is a social justice issue. This is the same as racism. This is the same as sexism. And when we start seeing it that way and seeing all of our you know, acts of activism as in solidarity with one another's courses, that's how we're going to start like really getting stuff done. Um, I don't think that, you know, as you know, like obviously as a black person, people will be like, why, why are you focus on Black Lives Matter? And it's like, it's not, it's not either or, we're doing this all together. And I've just picked like a specialist area within that, but I stand in solidarity with all other social justice movements that are fighting for a positive future. I think that's a really valid point. I think sometimes we need to remember that as well, that it isn't, we can't box these things up in, they all interrelate, you know, and they all affect if it be our health, our mental health, our structure, our system structures. I think, yeah, that's really good to kind of remember. Um, I would also be interested to hear um, from Laura and Charlie, how you got into um, a green career, let's say, or what are the options for young people if they wanted to do that? I think education is quite like an important part of it. I think obviously to to know how to make a change, you've really got to understand where climate change sort of stems from and the impacts that it's going to have. I think that's mainly where there's probably a barrier to change. I think a lot of people have heard the term climate change chucked around quite a lot, but they don't actually know what it really means. They don't realise how many products are made from fossil fuels. Um, I think they normally maybe think, oh, you get your petrol and your diesel from fossil fuels, but so many things are made from fossil fuels and it's just not a sustainable way to do it. So I think once you sort of understand the, the root of the problem, it's then easier to know what alterations you can make in your life and where to sort of direct your change to. Um, but I just sort of fell into it by accident. It's always something I've been been passionate about. Um, and then I did my dissertation in it and I got I got offered the the an opportunity to do to do more on it and I just thought I couldn't turn it down and that it went from there. Yeah, I, I sort of experienced a very similar thing. As I said, um Teesside offers a, a students as researcher scheme. Um and I think 
there's probably other universities that offer something very similar and maybe even if yours doesn't there's always research going on in universities and I think just simply just asking and showing an interest with your lecturers is a really good way to get involved it's it's getting your name out there and then you know lecturers know that you're interested they know that you're a person that they can turn to and that that's how I've sort of gone on for the last two years and uni just going from one project to another and just developing it and, and it's amazing for developing your skills developing networking it's just it's a really good opportunity and Finn I'm really interested to kind of hear more like how easy is it to create a sustainable business uh, I mean starting a business first of all is really hard but uh, sustainable it it does you know come with its challenges uh you know, there are such things as finding, you know, resources that are what's it called sustainable. It's a, it's a lot harder to get your hands on than, uh, you know, uh, materials that are bad for the environment. But after you have that, you know, it can be a walk in the park, but it is, you know, it's a lot of effort having to start up your business. You have to get lots of contacts, get your names out, like get into like factories that uh, produce your you know, product. Our factories are all run in Portugal and, you know, took a while to get that contact as well. But after that, you know, it, it does get easy after time, but the first months are really challenging. But that those are also the best months as well because it's really fun. It's a challenge every day and, yeah, it's rewarding as well. And um, do you have kind of um, any tips for someone who wants to start a sustainable business? Because I know that sometimes it is, as you said, it's hard to find those resources. Maybe the supply chain isn't as um, clear about um, how environmentally friendly things are. Um, if someone wants to start a sustainable business, what some, are some tips that you could advise? Well, first, you, 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 know, you want to know what kind of business you want to start and you know what side of sustainability you want to tackle. Uh, we've... Uh, but, on link, we've found contacts on LinkedIn. So we, I've connected with someone in India and they produce uh, fabrics like out of bamboo and things like that, sustainable. And, you know, it's, I've got an awful lot of tips because I'm also quite new to it as well. Our business has only been running for four months, but you get a hang of it. But, you know, you can also work with old fabrics as well. That's what we've done as well. So we've contacted fashion companies that have leftovers, cutoffs. And with that, we've also upcycled clothing. And yeah, that's how, that's how we've done it. Great. And then another question I have is that, um, obviously everybody's doing quite a lot at the moment, but we do need to step it up a gear. We well, uh, probably a, a cup, like we need to really um, move fast with this. And I just wanted to hear about um, what specific challenges do you foresee um, taking place if we don't um, accelerate our activism? What do you mean by challenges? Sorry. So those challenges that could be environmentally, that could be um, through your business, you know, uh, like how are there any challenges to running, for example, sustainable business? Are, are there any kind of um, fears that you foresee environmentally, um, maybe within your studies or within your activism, that um, maybe that's even for days like legislation that is yet to be put through in order for there to accelerate change? Well, I mean, problems with running sustainable businesses, uh, you know, prices can also be higher so people tend to you know go for a cheaper option if there is things like that and you know finding sustainable resources it, it does get you know it can get harder and harder and getting your hands on that is you know it's challenging as well but I mean I'm I'm new to the world of business so I don't I can't really see the future and know exactly what challenges I'm going to face, but I'm sure there will be quite a few hurdles. And what about you, Days, in your kind of activism work? Is there any challenges that you either foresee or receive from your work? Yeah, definitely. I feel um, the more we fight for the future that we need, the more the people who are currently in control, who are profiting from this, will start getting angry. Um, Extinction Rebellion has seen this only in the last week where we have done our week of rebellion. Um, I was 
in the Times uh, the other day in a smear article. This is the reality of activism. Um, and I do you think that is going to be a point of where the media, especially certain parts of it, will make us seem like we are crazy. It will make us seem like we are overreacting to try and lull everyone into like literally walking off the plank. And I think what we need to do is remain vigilant and remain critical of what we're seeing. And also um, just, just keep in mind what's happening all around the world and have that very like global view of things. You know, like it's not just the Amazon burning and the trees, it's the people's homes, the people's livelihood, the people's generational land that's at stake, you know, and that that's going to be us soon. Last year, we experienced massive floods um, all across the UK. There's prediction that, you know, most of Lincolnshire ceased to exist by 2030. And that's the reality of climate change. Um, so I think it's, it's making sure that we understand that we aren't crazy. We aren't alarmist. We are people who care and working out of that place of care. Totally. Like a lot of my work recently is also kind of looking at um, our kind of connection to nature and, and why we've relied on science actually to tell us that there's something that's wrong. Um, you know, on a micro level, yes, exactly. We're not just thinking about the Amazon, but just in our local level, what we've um, realized that the, the, you know, what the climate crisis has already done to our environment, to our mm. health, to our mental health. I would also be interested to hear from Charlie and Laura, more, I guess, from the scientific point of view as well, of what other kind of concerns that you foresee for the future if we do not kind of um, accelerate our activism. I think, well, um, sorry, do you want to go first? You go, you go. Um, <laughs> I, I think um, maybe funding for research is sort of an issue. Um, I mean, especially at the moment, for example, you know, funding has gone on more important things for now, but funding for any kind of scientific research is is vital and I think the loss of that now is going to have big repercussions in the next few years especially for encouraging young people to get into those jobs they those jobs might not be there um, and I think that's definitely a big issue. Yeah I think at the moment especially in the the pandemic all the research is sort of focused on that and all the, the climate change and the environmental work sort of being put on the back burner a little bit but like Laura says if there's no funding there then it might be a, a case of too little too late um, and once once it's gone then, then it's gone and Speaking of like the, the forest fires and stuff, it's not just all the, you know, the, the people who live there, the natives and stuff, you've got all the, the lives that they actually hold themselves, all the, the small species and organisms that, that are in in these these rainforests and stuff. And if you even if you remove one from a food web or the food chain, it all it all falls apart. Um, wow. Is there an example that you can give us of that kind of if that happened from a, like a food chain, I know I've just put you on the spot there, but is there? Well, if you had sort of like a, a forest one, if you took something simple as this, the spider, then you're gonna have way more sort of more insects, more ants. And then if you've got nothing that they're gonna be fed from, then they'll sort of sort of take over, become more invasive and have a, a knock on effect. Um, or if you took out say something that like a worm, then nothing for the birds to eat and then they move and the, it, the, the function of the ecosystem will start to sort of disintegrate just by removing one or two of the of the, the components. And what what are the, I guess maybe looking at specifically the insects and the worms and, and spiders that you were talking about, I'm just curious, what are the things that do affect them? Say for example, at the forest in England and by human activity. If you look at sort of um, like climate change is affecting the pH levels of the oceans, but you're also going to have to think about the pH levels in the soils, whether they become more more acidic, which is is going to be quite likely, and then that'll also sort of have an effect on the lives that the the soil can sustain, whether or not the trees can grow, which obviously then has a knock on effect on our our carbon levels and how how well the trees and the forests are able to sort of you know keep keep their the levels lower which in turn if they can't do that will will sort of accelerate climate change and obviously all of this work is sometimes really it's really hard and i 
and exit is, exa is exhausting as well. And we've got a long way to go. I, I wanted to ask Jenny to end this open question to everybody, kind of what fuels your kind of inner eco warrior or that fire that motivates you to keep going? Uh, I think for me, I sort of always had a big interest in, in the natural world from, from being very young and enjoying just experiencing it, being out in natural places. And I think it makes me angry in a way to think that future generations won't be able to experience that just because of human greed. I think there's a lot of sort of anthrocentrism going around as, as to, you know, human beings are the most important. We're the ones that sort of deserve to take all of these things and it's not true at all and, and I think it's an anger more than anything else really for me yeah I can totally relate it just suddenly reminds me of this um book called uh, I can't actually remember something sweetgrass by uh, Robin Wall Kimmer and she describes how um like a, a little seed will know every what to do as soon as it's planted in the ground will know exactly how to feed itself how to grow where to will know everything whereas a human being and this is from kind of indigenous indigenous Native American culture uh, from the Potawatomi nation um talks about how um humans we don't know we have to learn we have the least knowledge actually in how we kind of find this balance within uh, the world and therefore the most to learn and I think you're right there Laura we've we we put ourselves right at the top and then therefore we and we, we're really we don't without realizing we are destroying things for ourselves really in our own decimation mm -hmm. um I, but I would love to also hear from everybody else about kind of what else kind of fuels your motivation to keep going I mean we've got you, you go. go. <laughs> no, you go. Go ahead, Finn. I mean, for me, like seeing in the news, like, you know, when they report what animals go extinct, you know, that, you know, that hurt. it doesn't hurt. But, you know, it's sad to see all those animals that no longer exist. And I remember seeing the blue parrot that was in Rio. It was in the movie. I forgot what movie. But I remember I loved that parrot and just seeing all those animals go extinct. It's just sad because, you know, they're beautiful species and because of our actions, they're no longer here. And it's just, yeah, that fuels me to keep going and take a stand and try play my role at least. Yeah, I, th I think we can all just make small, small changes. It doesn't necessarily have to be a select few having a big impact or making sort of extreme changes if everyone was to make smaller ones um it could it would definitely have a, a bigger effect when you think of like the great barrier reef and all the bleaching that's that's happened on the corals there it's just a, a massive a massive hit and to think that things like that could have stopped should people have decided to maybe you know think a little bit more about their actions or the ways that they maybe travel to work or the, the what they eat, um, the things that they buy. Just if everyone was to make some smaller, smaller changes, um, it would at least slow, slow things down. Mm. And what about you, Days? Yeah, weirdly enough. Sorry, Charlie, I totally disagree. <laughs> Um, I think, do you know that BP was the first person that invert, invented the idea of an individual carbon footprint, which is ironic. Um, there are people who do hold the power that that causes climate crisis. These people are CEOs. These people are governments who are deciding to be an act. It makes it harder for the individual to actually take place and be able to live environmentally friendly. Even the fact, like, for example, like Finn saying how sustainable products are more expensive this can be done by sub disease that they're giving to carbon high carbon um industries so it, it there are there are bodies in this <laughs> you know and i think we yeah. need to remember that and especially when it comes to talking about the individuals to remembering that like we have this system has been created to uphold these powers and we are within that and there is only but together through you know and other means we can start making sure that governments know they will be held accountable for the actions that they're making now and I, I think that's the fire that that really runs through me in exile we talk about this idea of love and rage where you have to have enough love for society and 
biodiversity and the earth um, but also you need to have the rage to say I deserve better and I deserve more and that's my right by being here you know and I think that that that's really what the really like pushes me it's yeah it's the beauty of you know like even the fact that we are in a climate crisis and the world is so beautiful already imagine what it could be like if we're not only sustainable but we're regenerative in our practices and the way that we live and even like you know with XR it does have that effort of like actually changing the person so this doesn't happen again and that that is a world that feels you know utopian but it is achievable um and I feel like that's that's what really keeps me going it's it's the beauty and the love and um how can we get involved more with activism um either through kind of other local startup groups or whether it's XR how how can how, if we if we've got people listening how can we get more involved I think join XR <laughs> Um, obviously, I would say that. Um, but at the same time, XR is a you know civil disobedience uh, organization. However, um, there are so many ways to rebel than getting arrested, and I think that's a thing that we need to say a little bit more more often and more openly. Um, I, I feel that take just taking actions in the way that you live your life. It is, it is a really important way to start morale. But I, I think it is that community and coming together and learning how to hold one another as well. Um, because, you know, for me, a lot of my work is around that kind of human side because, you know, like climate change is happening if we're being realistic for ourselves and we have reached tipping point. So we will have certain amount of years of extreme, extreme effects of climate change. Um, now we're basically trying to mitigate the losses at this point. Um, but what we need to do is we need to start building real communities that are strong that will hold each other and that won't eat each other. Um, that's, that's the thing um, because we saw with COVID a matter of weeks into it people were caring about themselves people are saying I need toilet rolls I'm about to buy at a whole store and I don't care about you know the disabled people who won't be able to access this I don't care about the marginalized people who are economically deprived who won't be able to access this and it just became me 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 but then after when we stopped and looked that's when mutual aid came out and that's when we learned how to say how can I be of service to my community and that's how we got through this pandemic. We got through this pandemic by showing appreciation and gratitude to our key workers um, by respecting what was happening and staying at home. And these are the kind of like ways of being that we need to start inheriting. So we don't only stop climate change, but we actually improve the world that we live in for everyone. Yeah, I think from that as well, I think the real strong word here is communities and especially within COVID as well. That is, it's been a necessity um, for us and when you mentioned things about, yeah, overbuying Lou Roll, and we, we all inherently in ourselves have this, um, I guess that side, that anxious side of, of me take, help ourselves. And I, um, but we have seen some gems within the kind of storm, let's say of COVID. And I'd love to hear if, if there's any examples individually from anybody who's kind of, what types of communities you've connected with, whether that's online or within your kind of local community and how that's helped you within COVID. Um, the, there's there's a great business sort of locally to me. Um, it's it's called Refuse. It's it's a cafe that sells um, goods from supermarkets that would otherwise have been thrown away. It's it's, it's been going for years now, and it, it primarily helps sort of um, lower income people get access to to food and things that they might not otherwise have. Um, and that's really stepped up a lot since the pandemic. It's really helped people. Um, homeless people but also just just generally low-income families um have access to food but also toiletries and, and masks as well and I think that's been really nice to see a, a, a big community effort to help to help people locally yeah and what other positive changes have you guys seen um within kind of COVID being kind of faced with this crisis either that's environmentally or through community because again I think they do come hand in hand um has anyone else kind of had examples within their own lives? I'm not sure if it's the same one, but um, near where I used to live, I moved like sort of in, in the middle. Um, but in Chesley Street, there was uh, the same sort of thing called refuse. And yeah, it's you the just, same. yeah, the same one. <laughs> um, but yeah, they, they did, they did good stuff. Right. 
And I'm just looking at some comments here from Sandra Sido, um, where uh, she says, um, there is a lack of understanding that everyone can become a change agent privately and collectively. And I think we've, I think Sandra, that you've hit the nail on the head. Um, and mm. then kind of going back to the work that I also do with Metis Arts, we, we feel sometimes like, because it's such a crisis that we're, we, we kind of take a step back and go, well, how, it's always very confused. Like, how do we deal with this? Why aren't the leaders doing this? Or what legislation we need to change? We're, we're looking at the upper levels, but actually there's so much things that we can do on a micro level or bigger. We can do it within our communities. And actually if you do it kind of on a kind of lower, I think it level, sometimes it, it can grow and grow and grow. Um, so I thank you for that, Sandra. I also would then therefore on that subject kind of ask you, what can you suggest um, if we're looking maybe from the example of a micro level of um, either changes or activism or kind of community led work that you can suggest to our kind of audience to some ideas that we could um, kind of move forward positively? Uh, I think probably one of the most important things is to just just take a minute to think about what you do and what the products that you buy in, um, the transport that you take in. It's not always possible to make those changes, but wherever you can try to make them. And, and obviously some people are more fortunate than others in, in that sense. And I think it's kind of wrong to ask people to completely change their lifestyles, completely change their diet or their buying habits, but just just take time to think about it. You know, do I really need this piece of fast fashion clothing? Can I get it from somewhere else? Do I really need to have meat in this meal? Can I switch it for something else? Just just taking the time just to, to think about the, the the actions that you're taking and just sort of slowly building up to, to do like what's in your what's in your power for your everyday decisions, if that makes sense. What other positive suggestions can we make? I feel linking to actually both points that have just been raised. I feel that, um, yeah, I, I think individual change is great. And I do agree with Laura. There is a certain point where you actually just have to be like, yeah, I live in a really shitty system and there is only so much I can do. Um, and coming to that terms is it's, it's really good, actually. Um, and I feel that um, the way I see it activism is by you know I came in and someone held my hand through it and then now that I'm strong enough I can hold someone else's hand through it and I think it is like being able to reach out for help and asking for assistance from people and having like you know fostering that real like spirit to do stuff together I think that COVID um you know almost like the bleak positive of COVID was that it showed how the system is so unfair it really highlighted the you know the 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 strifes of the marginalized groups, the point of no one could pretend it wasn't happening anymore. Um, and also it showed what the government could do if they wanted to. It broke through what we were told was impossible and it became possible. And I think this is where we need to start taking that with what Sandra is saying and using that agency to fight for the impossible, you know, because like who are they to tell us what's impossible when we vote them to represent us? And that is, you know, that is democracy. Um, and we should be like fighting for truer forms and forms that, you know, aren't Ponzi's, like what's going on with Boris. <laughs> is there anything else that anyone would like to add about any kind of positive change? I think if you just maybe started a conversation with younger people at younger ages about climate change and the climate emergency and how different forms of pollution contribute towards it. And I think if you just maybe tried at younger ages than they are now, because I don't remember getting taught about it really at school. Um, I Time. think for the yeah, I think for the most part, you, they didn't even massively sort of cover it in in university. Um, but I think if you just started that conversation with them from a younger age and just give them the, the knowledge and then they can then, you know, start making their, their own decisions and it's always sort of instilled in them, it's not going to be such a big change. It'll be like, well, well, I've always used a bamboo toothbrush, so it's it's not all that different. I don't eat meat with every meal, so it's it's just not what it's not going to be like a shock to the system as much for them. 
And I guess Laura and Charlie working kind of more in um, academia, I, I would wonder whether the, if, if you have any um, imaginative ideas about what kids should be learning in primary school or even in nursery that can help with that kind of transition of really educating ourselves. Definitely, they, they all start learning science to, to some degree when they first start learning to, to write and stuff and read. If you were just to sort of put in like a, an animated sort of or illustrated kids book about how, how it affects people, but not necessarily just how it affects sort of their lives, but the lives of like indigenous people who are really, really going to sort of, you know, feel the brunt of climate change. Yeah, I think um, maybe ecology is quite important as well. Um, I don't remember touching on any of that at all in school. I don't know if it's changed since then, but I think um, just trying to get a little bit more of sort of respect for their environment, the respect for the animals that they live around, because I think a lot of children really don't know any of that, especially if their parents aren't sort of interested in nature. And I think introducing that in schools would, would be quite inspiring for some kids because I, I think it wouldn't take much for them to sort of be inspired and have that passion because a lot a lot of kids like being out in nature a lot of kids like things to do with animals and I think yeah I think I think that would be a really good sort of addition to to the science that they're already taught. Yeah I think you're right Laura and I think you know even me I, there's things outside that I look at and I'm, I know it's a tree but I don't know what type of tree mm -hmm. I don't know if it's a native species I don't know what the animals are around I've only started learning to to garden and I've you know realized how pumpkins grow or I've realized actually this is how sweet corn works you know it, it, it it's actually we should know this you know yeah um yeah. I yeah, think a, a, a lot of kids sort of, you know, from a young age, they, they know the, the big charismatic species, they know the tigers and the giraffes, but they couldn't name many native species to Britain. And I think a lot of adults, you could probably say the same thing. And I think that's a big problem in general with conservation. There's a big focus on the charismatic species, whereas if you know anything about ecology, you know that all species are important to to the environment that you're in. And I, and I think teaching them about those species from a young age could could maybe sort of sway that I don't know <laughs> yeah absolutely well thank you so much panelists what we're gonna what we're gonna do now is we're gonna move on to the world cafe um section um so um what we're gonna do is that a tease valley nature partnership which we also want to thank by the way for for helping us kind of um host this